know, it was a little movie. Shot quickly, and it was just a little low budget English comedy. 200 million worldwide. Um, yes, I think we were all surprised. I don't think any, any of us knew until it opened how it was going to work. The New York Times review was absolutely terrible. He hated it. Kill you! Kill you! Kill you. <laughs> this is nasty, mean comedy. <laughs> First time we read through the script, I, I didn't understand it. It made no sense to me. Don't call me stupid. I still don't understand some of the lines I said. You and the London Underground is not a political movement. Jamie does not understand very much about what's going on around. Oh! I'm a big fan of yours. I'm amazed he's still alive. Poor guy. Now, I was at Oxford in the early 60s. John was at Cambridge, and I'd heard about him. He was kind of a legendary figure. I took a law degree, because in England, you can do law as an undergraduate. At the end of that, I went into show business. He and Graham were, were I think, two of the best sketch writers um, of that generation. I mean, marvelous material. And Terry and I were very jealous. And it turned out they liked what Terry and I were writing for the Frost Report. So a kind of, um, a kind of mutual um, appreciation society grew up between us. And that led, in the end, to, um, to Monty Python in 1969. He represented sort of a stuffy, you know, British, you know, either businessman or royalty or just a very hairy guy like in Faulty Towers. So he had sort of the classic behavior that we in the America associate with the Brits, and yet he was able to make it so comical and so smart at the same time. I love working in groups, and if you look at my career, it's been a question of one group after another, really. John was at his best when working with, with the group. In 1981, uh, by which time I was John's financial manager, and was running his little company. Uh, his little company started, uh, engaged Charles Crichton to start work on the project that six years later became a fish called Wanda. Well, I remember when, when John said, now he hasn't directed a feature in over 25 years, but don't let that put you off. He was a little bit doddery on his feet. He had to lie down at lunchtime and, uh, and he was tired by then. He used to have trouble with his false teeth and speaking. Well, you would talk, you talk out of side of his mouth like that. Get this scene shot, and I don't want to hear any more. It was a strange little joy. He had a life of its own. Just move around like it. All right, move on. Next setup. Charlie was, I think it's fair to say, uh, and I consider myself to be close to him, uh, irascible. His way of expressing emotion was to be appallingly rude because it was quite clear that, that he liked you very much if he could be that rude, because no Englishman would be rude enough to be rude to someone and mean it. And I think Jamie just thought he was completely crazy and off the wall, didn't know what was going on. You know, again, being from America, we didn't know who Charlie Crichton was. Well, Charlie was, in, was, was a wonderful old school Englishman, and I say that because he really had Scottish ancestry and would go on a bit about being Scottish, but it was nonsense. I mean, he was English through and through. He went to a good English public school. He was cutting film before Hitler came to power. He told me, for example, he had H.G. Wells in the editing room, um, cutting, I think, Shape of Things to Come. So he had a pretty extraordinary experience up to that time. But he didn't like Wells at all. He thought he was a bumptious, pompous little man who told Charlie that he could edit film much better than Charlie could. I knew Charlie from the Ealing comedies. I had loved some of the, the Ealing comedies that he had directed. The, the Ealing comedies was a series of comedies produced at Ealing Studios. It came just after the war, and there were generally group comedies um, with a sort of twist. There was always a sort of black edge to them. Full of eccentrics, but intelligent. And they usually involved things going wrong, you know, sort of heists going wrong and things like that. Well, Charlie certainly went to America and uh, started to direct Birdman of Alcatraz, and it was a very bad experience for him, and I don't think he liked talking about it much. In fact, when Charlie and I travelled together to New York for the first preview of Wanda, he and I made the trip together. He hadn't been to New York City since the 60s. Meanwhile, 
I brought Charlie into Video Arts, which is this little company that I'd formed with some friends, and we made management sales training films. And Charlie started to direct those, and we did a lot together. We probably did a dozen. And it was very comfortable, because Charlie was a master of camera and everything visual, but wasn't frightfully interested in the words some of the time. And I was interested in the words. So we made a good, a good combination, and we fell into the pattern where Charlie basically directed it, but I would make suggestions to the actors. And we were so comfortable in that relationship that we knew that that's what we were going to do once Fish Called Wanda started to happen. The screenplay for Fish Called Wanda, which went on to be nominated um, for an Academy Award, was six years in the in the gestation. It was kind of my idea, and I developed it some of the way with my own money, working the story with Charlie. And after a time, Charlie's back got very bad. And, uh, I mean, seriously bad. And we had to stop working together, and I actually thought at that point that it, that it wasn't going to happen. And then he went off and had some acupuncture. And it was quite miraculous. And he came and, and, and rang me and said, I'm getting much better, and I think we can start up again. And he was up and off. I think all of us, in an odd way, were affected by our success after Python, in that you feel, gosh, something is expected of you. He was used to success. He'd done well with Python, he'd done well with Faulty Towers, he'd done well with video arts in an altogether separate market. Um, he felt, as an individual, rather than a member of a comedy group, he could crack film as well. I felt very comfortable working with Charlie, and I knew that my memory of all these great Ealing films was, was, was very present. Although I wasn't consciously trying to write an Ealing comedy. But I do remember when we interviewed Johnny Jimson, when we were looking for an editor, and Johnny'd read it and he came in and sat down and Charlie said, well, what, what, what do you think? And, and Johnny was almost nervous and he kind of <clears throat> hummed and hard a little bit and then he said very uncertainly, well, it's an, it's an eating comedy, isn't it? <laughs> and we both said, yes! The finest show I ever saw in my life was a theatrical show called Beyond the Fringe. And I saw it in Cambridge in 1962. And it was an extraordinary two hours, because I never laughed so much before or since. They were all great comedy performers. And I somehow thought, if you get four funny characters, there are so many combinations that you can do between two, three, and four people seen, that the, you never get quite get bored, because it's, it, there's always a different feeling by adding someone or subtracting someone. So that was beginning to sort of inform my idea of four fundamentally funny characters that were all funny in different ways. Keen to consult with, 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 with me about the script. And so, well, I'll go and write a draft and then come back and we'll talk about it a bit more. Well, I knew that Michael Palin was going to be in it. Um, it would be hard for me to write a movie without Michael in it. Michael Palin, he's the hottie of the movie. You're a very attractive man, Ken. You're smart. You've got wonderful bones, great eyes, and you dress really interestingly. I mean, I can't ever remember him saying, look, I want you to play this character. No, I've written this for you, but I always assumed he had. I went to Michael Schamberg, who kind of understands Hollywood and who speaks Hollywood. I knew John Cleese because my ex-wife's sister-in-law was a roommate of John's now ex-wife. Michael Schamberg, who was one of the producers of the big chill, told me, you know, John Cleese wants to meet you. And then I discovered that he did this broad comedy. And I remember he said, I, and I'm writing a part for you where you are the most evil man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you spineless bimbo. I said, well, that sounds good. I never thought he'd actually do it. Truth is, I got the, the real key to the character out of Los Angeles magazine. I found there was a double page spread for a guru, and I'm pretty sure his name was Zen Master Rama. And he looked about 32 and very unsure of himself, and he had a funny sort of hairstyle, like a dandelion at the end of September. But the key thing was the, the, the line across the top of this two-page advertisement for the seminars he ran at weekends, which was, Buddhism gives you the competitive edge. And I thought this was unbelievably funny. <laughs> the more we worked on him, the more he started evolving into a guy who thought he was a genius, but in fact was quite stupid. After I'd got that, then it was a question of working with Kevin on it. I mean, after the first draft was written, 
uh, John and I went to Jamaica. We just talked all the time. And I'd say, play the scene, play the scene. And he loves to rehearse. He loves to act. John would have an idea, and he'd be talking about something, and he would spark an idea in me. And then I would start thinking about something and not hear what he was saying. And then and I li literally I said, yeah, what was the middle thing? What was the middle thing? That's that's Otto, isn't it? He would just get very loose, and one one day he just kind of went, <laughs> you know. And and I said, that, I don't know what it is, but it's wonderful. Maybe I am Otto. But I didn't think that I uh, was going to make Wanda American until my daughter took me off to see Trading Places, and uh, Jamie walked on the screen. I thought, who is this girl? I remember him saying, "I'm planning on writing this movie for." Um, Myself, Kevin Klein, Michael Palin, and I would like you to play the female lead. When I get a gut feeling, I tend to act on it. Nobody says this to you in show business and follows through. And she was quite quiet. So you kind of go, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. You're English, you're kind of odd. Okay, you're older than me, fine, whatever. I said, I've got this idea for a scene in which you would be in some state of nudity. How do you feel about that? Now I've figured out why he maybe called me. And I certainly wasn't going to do that. I was recently married. And she said, why don't you turn it the other right way round? You know, John, why don't you be the one to take off your clothes? I think it'd be a lot funnier if the guy took off his clothes. So it was pretty much her suggestion. Get undressed. He may deny there's a pattern here, but he'd taken off all his clothes in a short he did with Connie called Romance with a Double Bass. He'd taken off all his clothes to do the schoolmaster sketch in Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. and. You, if we turned up at John's house with the sort of setup you have for this interview, it sometimes worried those of us around, please, that he would immediately take off his trousers and, and, and underpants. I mean, John is also has a little bit of an ego. I mean, obviously, you have to on some level to be in show business. John was never not going to take off his um, his clothes in a fish called Wanda. And he made sure he was pretty trim. Dolly cool. He was doing a little sit-up work. Here was some push-ups. I think there was a little dieting. It is partly to do with the believability of the film. You know, if when I take my clothes off, the whole audience goes, yuck. That's one thing, but it also means that the Jamie character is likely to go, yuck. I don't think he was going to let himself look bad. There isn't much fat on him. Cock brim, you scut it. So you know, I was privy to his privy. Cool. You know, I had to be off camera, but I'm supposed to be upstairs. So I happened to be downstairs. <laughs> Will you leave immediately, please? I was kind of embarrassed writing the romantic scenes with, with Jamie because I didn't know how to play them and I don't think of myself as a romantic lead. We all play our cards and he just didn't get the leading man card. Michael Schamberg was the one who started at the beginning saying that this relationship between Archie and Wanda, it's the emotional core of the movie. And the idea of Wanda, this kind of barracuda of a woman, falling for this kind of geeky barrister is lovely and is unexpected and is part of the charm of the movie. I thought it didn't matter very much provided the jokes were good enough. And clearly John was not prepared for any of the love stuff at all. Trying to get the relationship right between Archie and Wanda was, was very difficult for me. I had no experience in it. Charlie wasn't terribly good at it. We did it really by trial and error. It was much darker. There was none of the love story. He was kind of pining for her, but she had absolutely no interest in Archie at all. It was certainly not something that was assured of working from the start. And I remember when I was telling you know, a few friends I'm going to go do this movie that John Cleese wrote, um, they said, oh, but that's British humor. That's, you shouldn't do that. Wanda had set itself a difficult task. Hey, great fish. Oh. A little squeeze of lemon, some tartar sauce, perfect. One of those was to combine a completely disparate set of acting techniques. Certain people are better later or earlier. Jamie was extraordinary about getting a great take straight off. Kevin is really great in take 10. Kevin loves a lot of takes. Kevin didn't really get going till about take six. He was just kind of getting into it and getting comfortable. It's like working with a child. You could do, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 takes with Kevin and get different variations of it. I'm not saying that he's a child. I'm saying that when you have somebody whose talent gives him the ability to kind of shake it up and do things differently all the time, you have to remain very consistent so that they can then use the take where he's particularly inventive. John and myself 
we at least to sort of work together. Everything that John Cleese has done is worked to the absolute most intricate. Every physical move is worked out. I rather like working like that. I don't know how creative it is, but that kind of detail appeals to me. My um, constant harangue was, oh, let's not work this one so much. Let's just see what happens. And you know, you, you just say, what, see what happens to John Cleese and he'll start sweating. And I have to be honest, the first day of filming, we weren't quite sure. I'm not gonna say I was suspect of John, but I, you know, I really didn't know what was going on. How it's gonna be shot, how it's gonna work, how it's gonna work with Charlie, how, you know, Kevin and Jamie and me and John are all gonna actually work together. People in the film business are strangely old fashioned. Um, I think they like the idea of management that you'd find in the army. <laughs> you know, the person up there tells you what to do and you do it. I remember that first day, as if it were yesterday, uh, just breaking every rule. He brought us all in. He wanted to feel that we were happy. He wanted to feel that we were all contributing because he felt that would make a, um, a happier ship. He was always open to ad-libs, suggestions. That way makes people uncomfortable at the start. I'd never, I wasn't a big star. It wasn't something where I was used to being involved in the process, so I just kept waiting for the shoe to drop. I remember John once saying, look, we're all going to direct this. And after about a week on one, the people got used to the fact that Charlie was calling all the shots, but that I was working with the actors a lot. And, and then after that, there were no problems, but it caused anxiety to start with. One should never underrate Charlie as a director. He directed with a great pace and liked, and keep, kept things moving along. He would not do a second take if he didn't have to. He had this great sense of economy, both in terms of his expression, but the film was just beautifully shot. He shot fast, fairly simple setups. He didn't use um, a lot of extraneous camera movement. The camera moves are always to support the joke. This guy knew how to shoot comedy. One of the biggest laughs in the film is when John is in the loft overlooking the Thames and uh, he and Jamie are lying on the bed and you see Kevin in the window behind them, you know. That joke doesn't work if the camera's like right on Kevin. It only works because you find Kevin and laugh at it like that. Well, I've always had this tremendous weakness for farce, or what I call French farce, because it does have a purity of structure. What's the matter? Oh, it's wonderful, Archie. And this particular scene in the middle of, of Wanda was my attempt to do it on screen. The problem is that when you're watching it in a theatre, you see everything. You know, you can watch all the things that are happening, and in the movies, the camera is pre-selecting uh, the stuff that you're looking at. And I thought Charlie really shot it wonderfully. I don't know anybody could have shot that particular sequence. So that's a great sequence. And of course, it's called the Fado sequence. You know, I would talk to my friends going, yeah, we did a Fado sequence. What Fado farce meant. I still really don't, you know, except that it was, uh, you know, originated by somebody. I mean, I truly had no idea. When Kevin gave that ridiculous name when he comes into the house. I'm uh, Harvey Manfred Jensen. That was pretty much improvised. And then when Mariah repeats the name. My father was in the Secret Service, Mr. Manfred Jensen. And that was Mariah's idea. So when you get all these good people contributing, it's amazing how rich it becomes. What? Uh, let's go to the pub, get a drink there. Would you like to come, Portia? I haven't been to the pub for 15 years. No, well, it'd be rather nice for Portia to see it now, wouldn't it, darling? Honestly, Archie. <laughs> Mariah Aitken, to me, is the funniest thing in the movie. Can I see that? What? In your hand. Your other hand. Portia, go to your room. She was absolutely perfect, and I, and I think... Had a good day? Those scenes she did with John were excruciatingly, embarrassingly awful. I spend the morning trying to get the waste disposal man to come, have lunch with Marjorie Brooks, who takes up the entire meal complaining about her husband, and then I have to play three rubbers with Philippa Hunter, and I come back here and Sanderson's have sent the wrong flowers. And she was not only great on camera, but there was something about bringing her in at that stage of the shoot that lifted everyone's energy again. <laughs> The only thing I'm really proud of in that movie are my feet when Kevin is absolutely hammering away at this woman. Yeah, because I was really bouncing on her. I don't know why it makes me laugh uh, that her feet are stock still and don't move. I ran out of the, the cheeses and various other menu items and, um, and I started singing Volare. 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 When he has his orgasm, 
I had to be buried under about four piles of pillows because I knew exactly what he was going to do with his face and his voice. And I said, God, I bet they'll never put this in the movie. They can't put this in the movie. You said you loved him! That's right, Otto. Now here's a multiple choice question for you. A, Wanda was lying. B, Wanda was telling the truth. Which one are you going to pick? What was the first one? When we would finally block a scene and kind of work it out, we then would perform it. And I remember we performed Wanda's scene where she yells at Kevin. The first time Jamie played that, she had us screaming with laughter. It was that kind of high moment at the end of a rehearsal day where it's like, yeah, well, that was great. And then we went and shot it. When we shot it, the first time was shot in the set of their apartment. We had a rehearsal um, before lunch and the crew weren't listening and Jane, because they were reading the paper and sort of tuning out for the lunch break. And nothing. Nothing. And that panic, that flushed face and that anxiety panic of, Oh, my God, this isn't funny. And Jamie got lost to confidence about the scene. And I kept falling deeper and deeper and deeper into, oh, my God, the only scene in the movie where I'm supposed to deliver the comedy, and I'm blowing it, completely blowing it. And when we came to shoot it in the afternoon, it didn't feel very funny. And uh, the, the staging got changed, but by that time, the scene wasn't working very well. By the end of that day, I was almost catatonic. I said, just keep going, because we, we'll get this back again. And Charlie lost his temper at one point and suddenly said, we can't go on shooting this. We have, you know, he was anxious about the schedule and banged the floor with his stick. And Jamie thought, well, if we can't be bothered to get it right, let's not bother at all. I remember I wrote in a journal that my agent had sent me, you know, I will never do this again. If I never have to be in a movie again in my life, I will never put myself in the position of feeling this bad. It was not a happy uh, set. I went to Michael Schamberg and John. Jamie didn't like her performance in it. She felt it was forced. John wanted me to be that kind of controlled person going very quietly and steaming. And I said, that's just not how I would have ever played that scene. So let's forget what was so funny in rehearsal when I was playing it locally. Give me something where I can run at it. The whole movie, this woman's so controlled that to me, what's funny is that she completely loses it. Oh, right! To call you stupid would be an insult to stupid people! Her instincts were right. Jamie's got really good instincts. I've known sheep that could outwit you. I've worn dresses with higher IQs, but you think you're an intellectual, don't you, ape? Jamie, I don't know if she has directed, but she should direct. I said, all I want to do is move. Now, let me correct you on a couple things, OK? I just want to be walking and screaming and just shouting at him. Aristotle was not Belgian. Oh. The central message of Buddhism is not every man for himself. And that's the scene in the movie. 98, take one. Mm. Action! Where have they gone? <laughs> what? What? What's the matter? The first time we did the Cathcart Hotel, it actually uh, was overdone. We were actually taking too long over. Have you got a stutter? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, uh, fine. Uh, uh, don't, don't worry. Do you, do you know where they've gone? Yeah, I... Fine, fine. Where? The... Gently. Yeah. Hotel. They haven't met until then. It's a great chance for a great... And it was written hysterically. Yeah, I'll write it. John was trying to go through the various stages, playing on the fact that this was incredibly urgent by, by sort of uh, delaying enormously the time it took to get the information out. Because there were five, six episodes of being unable to get the information out. Where's the paper? Quite a gothic scene in the end, you know, there's a lot, lot going on. Come on. When we shot it, it was, it, for my money, taken as a sketch, funnier than the version you now see. It had all sorts of other bits in. Look! No, no, for the pencil! Where is it? Oh. Remember, I think there were some quite complicated things that John did to sort of get me to, to uh, say it. Ah! 
John was at his faulty-esque, I guess, and just real Basil-type moments and slashing the finger. It, it sounds now like Grand Guignol, it, it, you know, but it was bloody good. But we sat down and worked out that it was holding up the pacing of the film as a whole. But it would have been great for Python fans, but John felt, and it was his picture, that A Fish Called Wanda was better for, a, you know, for that scene being a bit pared down and let us get to the airport. Cathcart Towers? Cathcart Towers. We, all, we also actually shot the ending three times. The original ending of the movie was much darker. There's a scene on the plane where John gets on the plane, Jamie's already on the plane with the jewels, and the first time we did it, John gets on the plane, puts his hand on the bag, and they just sort of glare at each other. And the feeling was that it simply wasn't warm enough. The um, costume designer and I had really a great time costuming this character. And in a department store in London on sale, we found a pair of shark shoes. And we bought them because we had we just thought, well, she's just a shark, you know? And we wore them in that last thing. And literally, the last shot of the movie was going down my leg and freeze framing on this shark shoe. And right then, you knew that she was going to take him for everything. The minute they got off the plane, she was going to bop him on the head, take the stuff, and leave. That was the original ending of the movie. So we played the whole movie with this very sort of dark intent. It was very black comedy. And of course, when they tested the movie in America, it tested very funny, except that people didn't like that there was no real love story. John wisely showed the film in uh, Hollywood to friends and people who could give us notes. Robert Town came to one showing, so on screening, and gave me, we only talked for 10 minutes, but he gave me such perfectly accurate, precise thoughts that I kind of ran off and wrote them all down, and that's basically what we did. We actually added some real warmth to the relationship between John and Jamie, which was everybody felt the film needed. We felt it needed another joke at the end. And the entire reshoot has to do with the love story. We, we previewed it after that, I think, in San Jose or San Mateo, and the scores were exactly the same. I remember seeing a screening of the movie and didn't think it was funny at all. Really thought, this is just disaster. But in the end, it's all about whether people go and see it in the cinema. Instead of going into a lot of cinemas, uh, we went into two in New York and one in LA and played for two weeks. Every hit I've had, all we did was set out to make a good movie, and I knew we'd made a good movie. It was, it was touch and go, and I remember about two weeks in, we got a two thumbs up from Siskel and Ebert, and that's when I felt it's going to be all right. And then, of course, we actually made money. We actually made some serious money very quickly, too. And then we met up with Charlie. And then that was great. And we could share that the thing had not just sort of been a, a, an unexpected pleasure to do, but it was been a world success. Obviously, he was quite old, and he hadn't had an opportunity in a long, long time. The important thing is he knew he'd been given a, a great chance that he th must have thought had been gone forever. After the success of Fish Corp Wanda, there was a certain amount of interest in him, again, at the age of 77. How many people can say their last film was nominated for an Academy Award and a DGA nomination? It's a great note to go out on. Come back, Ali. Row backwards. Row backwards. 